Marilyn Robinson published her novel Gilead in 2004, 24 years after she wrote her first and only other novel to that point. Set in a small Iowa town in the 1950s, Gilead is a deeply contemplative story about an aging Congregationalist pastor who recounts his life story to the seven-year-old son he had late in life. It's a novel infused with delicate moments of grace, family trauma, and a surprisingly theological vision of life on the mid-century prairie. Gilead won the Pulitzer Prize and garnered praise from religious and secular critics alike, who often noted just how Protestant and even Calvinist the novel was. The review in the Sunday Times noted that Robinson, who draws deeply from the theological well of John Calvin, Jonathan Edwards, and Karl Barth, offers an invitation to meet the Calvinist soul full of Calvinist wonder. Three subsequent novels, Home, Lila, and most recently Jack, delve deeper into the world of the characters of Gilead, plumbing the themes of loss, abandonment, addiction, but also redemption and the constancy of grace in our ordinary human lives. Today, we'll host a conversation about Robinson's novels with two former podcast guests, Justin Bailey, a fellow fanboy of Robinson, and Jessica Houghton Wilson, who has written about her reluctance to embrace the literary and theological vision of Robinson's literary landscape. Jessica is Louise Cowan scholar in residence at the University of Dallas. She is the author of three previous books on Flannery O'Connor, Walker Percy, and Dostoevsky, and co-edited the book, Souls and Nietzsche and American Culture, The Russian Soul in the West. In the spring of 2022, her new book, The Scandal of Holiness, Renewing Your Imagination in the Company of Literary Saints, will be published with Brazos. Justin is assistant professor of theology at Dort University and works at the intersection of theology, culture, and ministry. His recent book, Reimagining Apologetics, The Beauty of Faith in a Secular Age, asks his readers to rethink Christian witness, not as a defensive, overly intellectual project, but as an attempt to reveal the beauty of an imaginative faith. So Justin and Jessica, it's really a delight to have you both back on the podcast. Thanks, Davey. Yeah, it's good to be here. So, uh, Justin, uh, we're going to begin with you as uh, the resident fanboy. I'll kind of claim to be the vice fanboy here. Uh, but I was wondering if you could just tell us a little bit about what first draw you to Robinson and what what is it about the her world and uh, the characters that she's now been playing around with for four discrete novels that attracted you to her writing in the first place? Yeah, I mean, honestly, I was a little bit late to the party. Um, I was writing a dissertation on George MacDonald. And at the time, that's what was going to be, he was just, just him was going to be the subject of my dissertation. And uh, as I was working on that project, it sort of shifted in the direction of apologetics and what does it look like to do a more imaginative approach to apologetics. And so I started looking for a contemporary uh, conversation partner for George MacDonald, who was coming out of a similarly Protestant imagination. I was looking for that specifically with somebody with sort of not necessarily holding to all the confessional, uh, the confessional principles of uh, reformed theology, so much as working out of what was explicitly a Protestant imagination. And so somebody had suggested to me that I read Marilyn Robinson. And uh, so I picked up Gilead and thought I would just read it on the plane on, on the trip, you know? And if you've ever tried to read Robinson, that doesn't work, you know? Uh, it's like I had, we had a student in a reading group who said, yeah, I tried to listen to it on an audiobook at 2.5 speed and it, it didn't work, you know? Um, because, you know, it's, you can read maybe five or six pages at a time. And if you haven't fallen asleep, you know, uh, then, then perhaps you have some sort of epiphanic experience. Uh, so that's my, was my introduction to, uh, to Robinson was reading Gilead and having to read it very slowly. And there are just these sh passages uh, of, of prose that um, I sort of had sharp experiences like, like you have when you're reading poetry, perhaps, and loved it, Lo loved Gilead, uh, which then sort of sent me on um, a quest to read everything else that she'd written. Um, I, I tried to read everything that she had written up until that point. I didn't read her book on nuclear energy in Britain, but uh, tried to read almost everything else and just really fell in love with uh, both the very unique style that she has, as well as the broader um, kind of visionary perspective that she's writing from. You, you quoted the Calvinist, Soulful of Calvinist Wonder, which is actually from one of her essays, um, 
an introduction to John Calvin that she wrote. And there's another line in there where she says, what she says that what is unique about Calvinist writing, and she's specifically talking about Emerson and Thoreau and Melville, she says is the shock of revelatory perception. And, um, and I think that's what I experience um, in Robinson is the sense of the shock that in everyday life, um, grace showing up in, in the most mundane and ordinary ways as ordinary, um, ordinary life is all of a sudden uh, shines like transfiguration as she would, as she would say it in, in Gilead. So yeah, that's, that's the, the primary thing that has drawn me to Robinson and has kept me um, reading her, uh, her work. Her work, as you know, it's, it's, you know, deeply infused with a sort of almost like pre-modern theological tradition. She's resourcing figures like Calvin and actually standing for, um, on, you know, in favor of figures like the Puritans who often are, are maligned in today's culture as being sort of retrograde, again, pre-modern thinkers. And yet she's drawing on them and trying to weave them throughout her stories in really interesting theological and literary ways. So I was wondering, Justin, could you also explain a little bit, like, what is it do you think about her writing and her literary imagination that appeals to not just secular readers, but also secular readers who, you know, would normally, if they've heard of Calvin, probably only have horrendous, you know, uh, mental images and associations with the Calvinist tradition. Um, so what is it about her, her writing and her use of these sources that you think is, is so attractive to so many? Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, I think she's a contrarian. Um, and uh, I think that by itself is sort of attractive to people. It's very difficult to put her in a box. Um, and so you can't write her. It's, it's hard to write her off, I think, from a secular perspective. Um, she's sort of done the work and um, has the resume, so to speak, you know, that, that you have to take her seriously. Uh, from just a literary perspective, though, I think that there is, again, that idea of, of grace that shows up in her work that I think uh, we are hungry for. Um, and maybe we could talk in a second whether it is a cheap grace or a costly grace, perhaps. But um, it, it is certainly a, a story in which grace shows up. And there is one review, I think it was in the New Yorker, and it was written by an atheist. And this is the thing that ultimately made me think, okay, this is, this is my conversation partner. As you said, uh, the reviewer said, I'm an atheist, but her work allows me to see what it would be like to live in a world that is deeply fallen, but loved by its creator and suffused with divine grace. And that's really what I was, I, what, what I was looking for. I was looking for um, Christian authors who wrote in a way that created a space of imaginative hospitality. And, and I think that's one of the things that she excels at doing is creating a space where um, we can entertain the provocation of belief um, and, and see the beauty, the beauty of belief, whether or not ultimately uh, a secular person or, or a non-Christian finds it fundamentally compelling, uh, it at least allows them to enter in and feel the provocation of, of Christian faith. Thanks. All right, Jessica, one of the great rifts in our friendship that has somehow survived this is <laughs> your suspicion or reluctance. How, I'll, let you, I'll let you use your own words to describe your relationship and attitude to Robinson, but uh, let's say a less of a, an enthusiastic response to Robinson than the one that Justin just expressed and that I, I probably shared to some degree. So I was wondering, could you explain um, your experience and your relationship with the, the work of Marilyn Robinson, and what are some aspects of her work that you find, I'll use the word unsatisfying? Sure. So I first read Gilead in 2004. I was teaching at a classical school and we assigned it for our summer reading to kind of kick things off with the seniors. It was the wrong choice for that setting and that audience for sure, because um, you don't, you shouldn't give it to a bunch of 17 year olds, <laughs> I don't think for their summer book. And I think my thing with, with Robinson, um, ultimately my first read for her, and I say this with knowledge of how great she is. I do know that she's great. I also know Wendell Berry is great, but they both bore me. So for me, if I'm going to read Robinson or Barry, I prefer to read them in chunks. So I can take a passage of Gilead and I can relish it the way I would a poem and really enjoy it because there's beauty in her language. She is a master of the sentence. She chooses her words well. You really get the sense of, of enchantment in her language. And, and so the, all of that appeals to me. 
but only in bite-sized bits. Reading her all the way through is, is not compelling to me. And I think that's a matter of, of taste and not a matter of um, aesthetic like appreciation or not, I really do understand why it is that Robinson's great. I just don't want to read a whole lot of it, <laughs> if that makes sense. I really prefer the kind of um, stark and unsettling imaginations of people like Percy and Dostoevsky and O'Connor and John Kennedy Toole and David Foster Wallace. I mean, uh, the more unsettling, the better for, for what appeals to me. So is it a sort of gentility to, to Robinson's characters? Is it the setting in that sort of more small town, rural Iowa? I'm, I wanna dig a little deeper into this and maybe we can do some armchair right. therapy. What is, what is it that, does, again, doesn't satisfy your, your literary thirst? And I'm talking literary, we're not going theological yet. So literarily, nothing happens. And so I struggle with that kind of slow, gradual storytelling of the everyday. And that's, I mean, that's pretty much in everything for me. I don't like watching family dramas. I, I don't like watching any dramas, actually. I prefer either Coen Brothers or comedies or something that's fast paced and moving and exciting. And I understand that in our fast paced culture, people get distracted and turned on to the wrong things instead of the right things. And so Robinson does provide this antidote for our culture to be able to slow down. We should be meditative beings. There's definitely a time and a place for contemplation and contemplation is the highest end. So that should fill much of our day. So I know that that's what she is doing. But for me to sit down and read um, about an ancient man in Iowa, and especially for this particular character, I don't like John Ames <laughs> because I just, I don't like that he doesn't step up to the plate and take care of Jack and his family. He completely lets me down. He frustrates me to no end. The fact that he doesn't understand what his grandfather was up to his grandfather is the most interesting character in Gilead. I would read an entire novel about his grandfather because his grandfather is like an O'Connor character, right? This holy fool in the middle of Iowa who's ready to take everybody on. I am on board with that character. But every other character, um, I, I find lackluster and unappealing. Justin, you need to weigh in here, I'm afraid. I, I saw I saw your yeah. bleeding across I mean, your face. First of all, let me just say I absolutely agree that nothing happens. Um, I was just talking I was just talking to a friend about um, he was wanting me to to shoot a little blurb for his class that he's teaching through Gilead. And it's like, yeah, I'm gonna say like this is a book where nothing happens. And so if you're looking for action, this is not the right place. This is why you can't read it on a plane. It's not a page turner. Um, it is sort of this kind of meditative uh, prose that is trying to change your perception um, slowly. Um, I, I do think that, yeah, we, we've kind of gone back and forth a little bit about the O'Connor conversation. And um, one of my favorite memories is of uh, when we were all at this conference together and I had a chance to be the chauffeur for uh, Robinson and Tish Harrison Warren. And, you know, Tish loves O'Connor and Robinson and so, Tish was pushing back and asking all these great questions about why don't you love O'Connor? What about this? What about that? And so I wanted to ask Jessica, um, yeah, how you are an O'Connor scholar. And so how much of your, Robinson is on record as not liking um, O'Connor. And she says she doesn't love her characters. And um, perhaps this is a major difference between these two authors who are both great. Uh, so how much of it is, yeah, you're, you're, your dislike of Robinson owing to sort of, don't say that about my girl, you know, don't, don't say that about Flannery. Um, I, I guess maybe to put it a little bit more pointedly, why not just ignore Robinson? You know, why sort of go on record against, against Robinson or something like that? Sure. So no, I started teaching Robinson way before I knew she was against O'Connor. And I actually, um, I had dinner with Robinson a few times over the years, uh, she was at Baylor for a weekend. She, when I was a grad student, so I did the chauffeur thing and, and took her to dinner with a small group. And um, so I've had several conversations with her that had nothing to do with O'Connor. I had no idea that was part of, of her thing actually. And I was at the Dort conference where she was speaking. And I think Davey kind of set me up because he asked me to lead a book club on Gilead knowing that I'm not a huge fan. And, 
I led the conversation and there was a lot of pushback it was really good having these conversations with people who are just such fans. And I felt like at that point, that's why I felt the need to write a defense because here I had this group that was just so in love with her. I thought, well, have you ever considered the things that might be wrong with what she does theologically? I mean, I teach her all the time and students go back and forth between adoring her and fanning over her. And I don't, and I haven't. And so that's the reason I kind of stepped up to write this response. So when I teach her, I point out what I find to be the most unsettling aspects of her work and then just allow students to respond. They can either embrace that, they can refute it, not a problem. I don't go either way in my classroom, um, but just trying to push back a little bit about this adulation, and which I also understand. I mean, you were talking about George MacDonald and looking for a Protestant imagination. I mostly have to study Orthodox and Catholic writers because there's not a lot of amazing fiction writers in the Protestant tradition. And so we have to find them and we have to raise them up when we do. And Robinson's one of them, right? And so in that sense, we still need to hold her in high regard and, and claim her um, for the church and what she's doing. Yeah, I'm sort of being playful and asking that question, um, <laughs> wondering if there is so, almost like this moment of recognition where you, when you heard you know, what she thought about O'Connor, you're like, oh, it all makes sense now. Of course, you know, of course, there's this sensibility that is really important to me that is embodied in O'Connor that Robinson is almost going in the opposite direction, you know, whether that's um, the violence of grace in O'Connor, you know, versus the, the way that grace is portrayed in, in Robinson. Well, and I think that's a fair question too. I was at a um, speaking engagement. You've asked why I'm bringing up Robinson. Well, it just seems like everyone brings her up with me. It's almost like I go to these events and I talk about the Christian imagination and everyone's like, do you love Robinson? And so then I just feel like I have to say what I feel about Robinson. But I got into this conversation of this debate between O'Connor and Robinson with somebody who was writing their dissertation at the University of Dallas on Robinson. And we just dominated, you know, there were 10 other people in the room. We just dominated the conversation with this back and forth. And it made me want to sit down and just write, write out what we had said. Here's the pros, here's the cons. Um, here's where this imagination really appeals to me and O'Connor. Here's where I, I'm not as, um, as secure with what, with what Robinson's doing theologically. And is that the piece that the second piece that you wrote where you compare it to Dostoevsky and Tolstoy? Mm -hmm. So I think we're, we're slowly kind of uh, inching up to a, a discussion of the theological differences, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna hold off on that for just at least a couple more minutes to stick with uh, this more literary question. One of the lines in, in your, your second piece that, that Justin just mentioned, Jessica, was this, you said, whereas Robinson's fiction is intellectual, O'Connor's is imaginative. So I, I want to ask you to expand on that. Um, I, I have some some reservations, but I thought perhaps you could just kind of unpack what you meant with that line, and then maybe Justin and I could could maybe push back a little bit on that. Yeah, I think I say later I I expound upon imaginative as visceral. So for me, an image bearing. So for what I find in O'Connor, the images really strike you, and uh, you you hold on to this image of Mrs. May being gored by the bull, and you hold on to this image of the grandmother left on in the ditch, you know, with her legs crossed and the, the holes, gun wounds in her chest. And there's so there's this image that you can feel bodily in O'Connor. And I think that has so much to do with her Catholic imagination, right? This idea of the things of her faith and the images that are so significant to the Catholic imagination. Whereas in Protestant uh, imagination, especially in Robinson's version of it, which as you said earlier, Davy is this pre-modern idea. It is, it's a dialectic. And uh, oh, I mean, Robinson would say that unabashedly, she is trying to engage us in a dialectic. And so her works, especially like the epistolary nature of Gilead, O'Connor never could pull off the epistle, uh, epistle novel. Like she tried, her third unfinished novel is Letters. And it just is failing because it didn't have the dramatic tension that she was able to create in her other works. And Robinson can pull it off in a way that O'Connor just couldn't because of their different ways of thinking through these things. And even Jack, I will say that was one of the hardest parts of Jack 
it just felt like this really long interior monologue, like existential crisis for, you know, 200 something pages. And um, the images don't stick with you in the same way. So, I mean, this is interesting to me. I, I, I think I, I am with you in terms of sort of the, the striking, often apocalyptic imagery that you get in O'Connor, like the, the, tattoo, the tattoo across the back. Like there's so many just like striking things that honestly, I remember more visuals from O'Connor's writings than I do written lines. Uh, and that's an interesting feature. And I do think it's different with Robinson. And yet, in my memory, when I when I'm thinking back to especially Gilead, which is the one that I've I've read the most times, and I read I think like you when it first came out, uh, I was still in college at the time. Um, there are there are scenes that stick with me, not like striking images, but like scenes, like the horse stuck in the ditch, or like I'm going to read a passage in one moment from the end of Gilead that that has stuck with me um, for years now, and so it's not so much like these striking like violent. Um, eruptions, um, but rather a sort of um, almost like an atmosphere that that from from Robinson's writings that kind of just like saturates you as you're reading it. So I'm going to read one passage. And I thought maybe we could we could then question whether your distinction between Robinson as the the, you know, focusing on the intellectual pieces and O'Connor on the imaginative how that would play out here. This is from the end of Gilead. This is a passage that I read actually um, in the podcast I did with just Justin uh, last fall, because it's one of our, our favorites. We, we, we read this together in a book club some years ago with a bunch of students. So this is at the end of Gilead uh, when John Ames, the figure you, you don't like, Jessica, <laughs> uh, is, is concluding um, you know, his, his epistle. He's, he's, the implication at the end of the book is that he's, he's probably passed away and that's why the writing stops. But this, there's this sort of almost like, I take this to be an almost beatific vision that's happening at the end of the novel. So he says, I love the prairie. So often I have seen the dawn come and the light flood over the land and everything turn radiant at once. That word good, so profoundly affirmed in my soul that I am amazed I should be allowed to witness such a thing. There may have been a more wonderful first moment when the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy. But for all I know to the contrary, they still do sing and shout and they certainly might well. Here on the prairie, there is nothing to distract attention from the evening and the morning, nothing on the horizon to abbreviate or to delay. Mountains would seem an impertinence from that point of view. So th this to me is just, it's one of the most beautiful arresting passages in the book. And it's something that, um, uh, as I, I read Gilead at various stages of my life, you know, for the first time in college, and then later on after I'd had a son, and then later on uh, after I'd moved to Iowa, and this this the scene of the prairie and and John Ames seeming to like see almost like the image of God like in nature that has stuck with me um, in the way that a lot of say a lot of the transcendentalist literature from the 19th century also really sticks with me like a Moby Dick sort of thing. And so I'm wondering, it, is this still though? Is this this to me strikes me as a sort of um, a rich imaginative vision? Uh, and not purely and just an intellectual one. I'm curious what you make of passages like these, Jessica. I find it a completely intellectual passage because so unless you have seen the prairie, if you're imagining that you're living in Prague, so I taught this novel in the Czech Republic, they had no idea what the prairie was. So we had to look up pictures of it because nothing in this passage tells you what it looks like. And even in this passage, everything turned radiant, but there's no color. Whereas in O'Connor, the dominant color is always going to be the red because of the red dirt roads, the red sun, you always, or the white sun and the gold in the afternoon. I mean, everything in her world has specific color and texture to the image. And everything in Robinson's world is this transcendental vision, this intellectual enlightenment imagination that it doesn't locate you with texture or color or specificity. I mean, even the words, right? Um, mountains would seem an impertinence from that point of view. Like, there's very few people in rural Iowa that actually talk that way. I mean, this is a very different kind of narrator. This is Robinson dialoguing with other intellectuals about the way she contemplates the prairie, which is, is great and it has its purpose and it has things that other people can hold on to. Um, but I don't think that it has the image or the visceral quality of, of other kinds of imagination. 
Yeah, I wonder if if we use the words vision, visionary and visceral, if, if that might, I, I like it better when you said it's visceral versus imaginative. Um, obviously, both intellect and imagination have long lineages as far as what we mean when we say when we say those words. But I think I am quite willing to agree if, if we say um, Robinson's prose is visionary in a particular way that O'Connor's is visceral, um, that O'Connor is trying to make me feel things in my gut um, and maybe hor be horrified sometimes. Uh, whereas um, Robinson is really trying to shift my perception. Um, so she talks a lot about light and water, right? Um, and light hitting the water, you know, and all of the words that we can use to describe what happens when light hits the water. Um, I think that's that's right. Um, that Robinson is certainly working with visual, visionary sort of um, imagination. Whereas I think that you're right that O'Connor is doing something different. Jessica, your uh, again, your objections or reluctance, whatever you want to call it, stems not just from uh, the literary sense here, but also from some theological reservations you have with regards to Robinson's writings. I wonder if you could explain what some of those are. Yeah, the more times that I have to explain my theological concerns, the more I'm just wondering how closet Catholic I actually am. Because, <laughs> I mean, I'm Protestant, I'm Anglican, but at the same time, I'm so much more drawn to the medieval imagination, the pre-Reformation imagination, than I am the post-Reformation way of looking at things. And the centrality, so I teach medieval literature and medieval thought, theology, and the centrality of the cross and the crucifixion is hard for me to get around. And this is what I would love you guys to respond to, um, because, of course, Robinson has flat out said that's not important to her, that Jesus could have died in any other way, and he didn't even have to die. That was just the way that he showed his love fully to us. There is no, I mean, she doesn't have a theology of atonement. She doesn't like the blood and guts of the cross. She feels no need to dwell on the humiliation of the cross. Whereas all of those things have been crucial, to use a pun, crucial for my understanding of the faith and the necessity of the cross. Um, where, where do you, how do you take that? How do you handle that in, in your understanding of what she's doing theologically? Yeah, I mean, so that criticism actually, I think, was also raised in, in a uh, slightly different way by James K. A. Smith a couple of years ago, who argued that and he's a, obviously a big fan of Robinson, um, probably uh, obviously more so than probably you would be, Jessica. But he also pointed out that for Robinson, there seems to be more a, a theology of glory and of the resurrection than a theology of the cross. Um, and this does, I mean, it, this, you, you frame it as a sort of maybe a, a medieval Catholic versus Protestant distinction. And I think there's some justification to frame things that way. It could also be an inter-Protestant distinction between the Reformed tradition and the Lutheran tradition. Uh, I, I've, I've now taught at both um, ref, a Reformed institution and now two Lutheran institutions. And, and there do seem to be some distinctions here in terms of what the theological emphasis is on. But Robinson, um, there does, it, she does definitely lean into this theology of glory that I think comes from both the reform tradition, but also from a sort of secularized transcendentalist um, bastard children of the reform tradition, like Emerson and Thoreau, all the way up into the early 20th century with the American pragmatists. And so I'm, I will just, in one sense, concede that I think you make a very valid point, um, that the cross does not loom um, metaphorically or even theologically in Robinson's work in the way that it would um, maybe in Catholic, but even maybe some Lutheran traditions. I don't mind that because I don't need all things from all from from all novels. Um, I can go I can go elsewhere and I can I do. I mean, I, I don't maybe love O'Connor as much as I once did, but I, I love reading O'Connor. I love reading Walker Percy. I wrote my undergraduate thesis on Evelyn Waugh and Walker Percy. And uh, Owen oh, Graham Greene, uh, another, I think, novelist of the cross, <laughs> and I think a novelist of reprobation as well. So I, I enjoy that. I enjoy reading those sorts of stories and novels, too. For, for Robinson, I think that I'm just very attracted by um, her emphasis on the ways in which grace is just very ordinary, in which glory, if, if, her, if she is a novelist of glory, um, she is a novelist of ordinary glory. Like, you find glory in in 
you know, the bubbles that are floating away from, you know, John Ames's child. You find glory in um, the sort of weird ex eccentricities of uh, John Ames's grandfather, this radical abolitionist, uh, you know, uh, before the Civil War. You find, you find these sort of instances of redemption and brilliance and illumination and transfiguration in very ordinary ways. And I guess I don't see that it has to be at odds with the theology of the cross in the Christian tradition. Justin, did you, do you, uh, do you buy Jessica's critique? Yeah, no, I, you know, in the chapter that I wrote on Robinson in my book, I um, interact with this uh, objection as well and say that, you know, she loves Calvin, but she leans really heavily on book one and not book two. So God, the creator versus Christ, the redeemer. And I think that's a fair criticism. Uh, I mean, my defense would be similar to Davies, you know, similarly with Catholicity, receiving the gifts of all traditions while recognizing the incompleteness of any one tradition. I feel the same way about the authors who form the Christian imagination, receiving the gifts that they offer by while recognizing the limitations uh, or the incompleteness of, of what they offer us. So I think that's, that's the first thing I think I would sort of say. At the same time, I'd want to mention that I do think that the grace that is in um, Robinson's, um, well, what, what do we call it? It's not a trilogy anymore. The, the Gilead books uh, is more costly um, than um, we can sometimes give it credit for. Uh, I think, first of all, I mean, the, the character of John Ames, I think one of the central points of that book is um, that despite how visionary his encounter with the world is and then his perception is, it's so limited. He doesn't see Jack. Um, for, for who he is uh, until maybe the very end. And then even, even that, we're not sure. And then she gives us multiple books, you know, from Lila's perspective and, and things like that. And then the other thing that I would say is, you know, um, Home, which is the next book after Gilead, uh, I think that is a book about costly grace. Uh, the way I describe that book to people is uh, love and action is a harsh and dreadful thing, not like love and sermons, um, because you have this contrast between um, Jack's father, who preaches all these sermons about forgiveness and grace, but is unable to do the costly work to welcome his son. And then his sister, Glory, who is living this costly, priestly, sacrificial housekeeping, you know, um, home, creating home, creating a space for Jack. And she's suffering through the entire book. She carries the cross, as it were, but it's in a very ordinary ways. It's not, there is a, there is a violent moment where uh, where Jack does something, but but for the most part, she's kind of carrying this ordinary, painful, um, piercing grace, you know, in order to extend grace to him on behalf of the family, she is the one who pays the price. And I think that that, given the limitations of, of Robinson's sort of aesthetic and theology, it, I think that she still does have that emphasis of how limited our attempts to participate in divine blessing are, as well as what it costs for us to, to participate. I mean, one thing also just to kind of um, go a little bit further with what Justin was saying and drawing on Home, the second uh, novel, is I, I do think that insofar as Robinson has a, a theology of the cross, um, or she doesn't have a theology of penance. And for her, maybe this is a, a sort of hyper-Protestant thing, but she thinks that the work of the cross has already been accomplished. There's no need for us to kind of suffer the cross uh, a second time. We don't, uh, we, we don't bear that burden ourselves. So in home, there's a passage, this is from Glory, uh, Jack's sister. Um, and she's reflecting on sort of the ways in which Jack's presence in the home, he's just come back after a long time away, has been a burden to her and also to her father, their mutual, their father. She writes, uh, or she says, there is a saying that to understand is to forgive, but that is an error. So Papa used to say, you must forgive in order to understand. Until you forgive, you defend yourself against the possibility of understanding. If you forgive, he would say, you may indeed still not understand, but you will be ready to understand. And that is a posture of grace. So it seems to me like, especially with the figure of, of Jack, who you know is, the, is kind of the sort of, I would say like the pivotal figure, the sort of the, the crux, the focal point of three of the four novels, at least, is that he is the sort of presence in everybody's life 
uh, in John Ames's life, in Glory's life, and then in Della's life, in this most recent one, that is it's a struggle because he he comes in, he's messy, he he's he feels he feels unworthy of being in the presence of all these people. He feels a deep sense of shame, and of course struggles with the idea of sin and and reprobation. This is the re the theme of reprobation is very prominent in a very important conversation in Gilead, and it also comes up in the sort of opening epic scene in the cemetery in Jack, the most recent novel as well. So Jack very much feels like he's in need of forgiveness and probably it probably feels like he has to earn some sort of forgiveness or, or do some sort of penance on his own to somehow merit his presence in these people's lives. And it seems to me that one the sort of the through line, the theological message of Robinson's writings is that Jack it's been offered grace by many people. Almost in, in three of these four books, again, he's, he's offered grace by people at, that's unmerited, but this grace is offered by human beings as a reflection of the sort of the ultimate dignity and worth that Jack has in the eyes of God. And Jack's struggle in, in each of these novels is sort of accepting his worthiness, right? He, he keeps backsliding into the sense of like, I have to earn this. And I think that's a really interesting, and I, again, perhaps hyper-Protestant way to think about that. But I think it is Robinson struggling with this idea of sin and penance and forgiveness in, in her own way. Yeah, what you bring up with the idea of penance is really interesting because of course, O'Connor's vision is purgatorial always. And so for her, the process of sanctification is not a matter of earning or receiving penance. But because there is so much of us that is still sinful, she puts her characters into these positions in which she allows them a moment to either receive that grace and move towards sanctification to be to be burned away, the sins to be burned away from them. Um, that that suffering can actually start that process of removing the things about ourselves that we don't like and that we don't want to be part of our imitation of Christ, right? Um, and so I I think in in these works, in these novels, Robinson's books, her characters are dealing with this knowledge of their sin and not knowing how to move towards sanctification. Because as you said, justification's already happened. Grace is already there. So then what does, what does the practice of faith then look like to help me get rid of these things I, I can't seem to let go of, these sins or what does he call them? Not temptations, um, inclinations, impulses, right? It's that Jack calls them just impulses that he just can't seem to get rid of. And there's no, there's no theology that he's been raised in that has, has shown him how to let go of those or how to be purged from them. So that's the doctrine of grace, the difference between perhaps O'Connor's medieval imagination and Robinson's, let's call it a transcendentalist Protestant one. But let's switch over also now to the sort of, I think a theme that's come up a couple times already, but we can maybe delve into now is that of um, the sacraments and sort of the, the bodily, or as Jessica put it, sort of visceral character of O'Connor versus what uh, could be a more intellectual uh, one that we find in, in Robinson. Jessica, what are some of your reservations about um, Robinson's uh, description of ordinary grace uh, by contrast to a, a, more, a more Catholic doctrine of the sacraments? I would say with the question, of, the sacraments is more of a question for me when it comes to Robinson's work because O'Connor's work, she was always saying like Violent Barrett Away was supposed to be a hymn to the Eucharist, right? She's always putting the sacraments as central ways of understanding the incarnation, right? They are the vehicle in which the transcendent participates in the imminent and gives us access to the transcendent. So in Robinson's vision, there aren't just vehicles for that. The entire world, everything is a vehicle for that. Like there's not specified church ordained sacraments. Everything can be a sacrament around you. So I'm, I'm just curious what what you do with that. I think of the moment in Gilead in which the his father offers Ames when Ames is a young man that sooty biscuit. And this is like a Eucharistic moment, but of course it doesn't have any of the church understanding of sacrament to it. And actually what's been broken is not the father who is handing it to him, but it's the black church that's been burned down in the town that's made the biscuit sooty. The sacrifice has been those who aren't even there anymore and who've disappeared from the scene in the moment. And what becomes sacramental is a relationship between him and his father, but it wasn't him or his father that sacrificed 
this moment for this Eucharist. So I, I don't know. So I, I look at those moments and they make me uneasy uh, to try to talk about sacramentally. Maybe you can cure me of it. I don't know. Yeah. So um, I think part of this is, is a tension that's just in the Reformation tradition, right? I, I call it the syndrome paradox after syndrome in the movie Incredibles, who's trying to make everything su everyone super so nobody will be, you know, if we make all places holy, then are any places holy? If every vocation is holy, are any vocations holy? And if everything is sacramental, does that mean that, yeah, God is not particularly present in the sacraments? And I think that Protestants are always going to sort of live in that tension and sometimes go way to the wrong side of it. Um, you know, the question is, does Sunday hallow all the days or does it get dragged down to the level of all the days? You know, so does a wider sacramentality dilute the particularity of the sacraments or does that spread holy? Does it go, you know, which direction does it go? Um, and I'll just say, you know, for me, the way that she writes about baptism, about the sacrament of baptism um, and that posture of blessing, you know, there's this wonderful passage where they, as kids, they baptize the cats, you know, you want to talk about, you know, some, the profane and the holy coming together. And he says, you know, we did respect the sacraments, but we thought the whole world of those cats. And he said, have you ever touched something with nothing more than the pure intention to bless it? And I'll, I'll be honest, I, I baptized a two week old baby on Sunday um, at, at church. And that was in my mind as, as, um, as I was baptizing this, this little one, this idea of the, the blessing of, that ministers have of being able to touch something with this pure intention to bless it. Um, as, and, and that's, you know, that, that sense of now go out into the world and be participate in divine blessing um, that is sort of sealed to us in our baptism. So for me, it, it works, the sort of everyday sacramentality, but I, I definitely think that sometimes I wonder if it can be sustained um, within, within Protestant circles. Yeah. I, um, I suppose, I suppose, Jessica, I have less anxiety about it. I, I, I grant your point that I think for, for Robinson, I don't know that there's something, um, as set apart for baptism or Eucharist, because you do see kind of these very ordinary instances of it, but there's part of me, and I, I did write an essay on this, uh, for comment some years ago, um, which is in one sense, a sort of, apology for why I'm Protestant, despite the fact that I went to Notre Dame for a couple of years and had a lot of my Protestant <laughs> friends convert in the process, and I didn't. And uh, one thing I write about in, in this essay is um, a memory that stuck with me from my childhood. I think I was in junior high at the time. And uh, we went to this really arch Protestant, conservative, Scottish Presbyterian Covenanter church that only sang Psalms, didn't use musical instruments. Like, I don't know you can get more Protestant than this church was. And uh, when I first got there, they only had communion like every quarter. <clears throat> um, they were super skeptical, not just of Catholics and Orthodox, but even like Anglicans who were basically on the road to Rome. Like there was just hyper suspicion of everything <laughs> that you love probably in O'Connor or Dostoevsky or Percy, everything. And yet, and by the way, I'm not part of this church anymore, <laughs> but, and yet there, there, was this, there was this memory I have. Um, there, was a, there was a homeless man who used to sleep in the mudroom in the basement of the church. And they would leave like this, this mudroom unlocked. And uh, it was startling to find him there sometimes on Sunday mornings if you were the first one to go in for Sunday school. Uh, but usually he, would, he was very harmless and he would just kind of sleep there and he'd wander off during the day. But one Sunday, I only remember this one happening one time, one Sunday he wandered up in the middle of the church service. And um, he wandered up and sat in one of the back pews and fell asleep and started snoring very loudly. And um, we got through the sermon fine. And we, then we got to, it, was, it happened to be a week where we were celebrating communion. And in the middle of the communion service, he kind of startled awake. And then he called, I said, people were handing out the bread at the time. And he said, where's my cheese? Where's my cheese? And everybody was kind of horrified. Everybody was like, what's going on? What do we do? You know, it's all these kind of very kind of prim and proper white middle-class Calvinists, <laughs> not quite sure what to do with this. And I remember uh, the elders going over to him and kind of talking with him and kind of kind of reorienting. I think he kind of woke up kind of disoriented. And um, they took him downstairs. And I remember they after the service, they, they fed him the leftover communion elements. And, you know, there was 
part of this at the time that struck me is it was kind of this kind of weird jolting experience. It was kind of startling as a young kid. It's a little nerve-wracking, a little scary. And yeah, I, it stuck with me that like the first instinct of these super prim and proper white middle-class Calvinists was to take these holy elements um, and, and give them to him in sort of ordinary act of service. He was hungry, you know? He didn't know what he was partaking of. Um, they, they hadn't really consecrated the elements in the way the Catholic Church would have you do. But they just thought, you know, we're going to give him this. We're going to feed him. We're going to minister to him. And it, they didn't worry about profaning the Eucharist. And that, I know this is kind of a trite way to put it, but like, I just feel like that sort of ordinary ministry is something I like about the Protestant tradition. There's not a lot of anxiety about this. Like, let's just feed this person. And this can be itself a Eucharistic ministry. Um, so I like that part of Robinson. <laughs> and I really, I feel like I have a fairly high view of the sacraments. I, I get teary when I see a baptism, especially infant baptisms. <laughs> and I love part I've missed communion. And, you know, I've only had it a couple times over the past year and a half because of COVID. Like I miss it dearly and doing virtual church and then mimicking the Eucharist with your own bread or wine is it doesn't feel the same. So I've missed that. I don't want to belittle any of that, but I, I, there's part of me that just likes the minimalism of the Protestant imagination and the Protestant approach to grace. I'll also say that Lila wants to become a Christian because she sees a baptism, right? And she wanders in off the street to get out of the rain and she sees a baptism happen and, and eventually she asks for it herself. And then the other thing is that when she wants to talk about how she has learned that, as she says, things mean something, her first example is you eat a piece of bread and it means something. Um, you know, so there is that sort of sense for Lila, at least, that the sacraments are the things that draw her to in the way that she conceives of what it means to, to be a Christian. And I haven't read Lila all the way, but I do remember there's that one scene where John Ames is saying something like, everything is prayer, prayer is everything. Do you remember this? Prayer, prayer, everything's prayer. I don't know, that, that's another one of those moments where I was just like, is everything if everything's prayer, is there prayer? <laughs> so, yeah. You know, the, these these moments just make me hesitate, like hesitate is the word Davey's using. They make me hesitant. It's a very reformed thing to say. People say that around here all the time. Our work is our prayer. Our, our life is our worship, you know, which obviously there, there's something right about that. But then you, you wonder, or you were, or we always joke here, everyone is a theologian, you know, even those of us who went to school for 10 years. Um, you know, it's sort of this dilution, you know, with the desire, what, what you lose, what you gain in extensity, you lose in intensity. And so this sense of, you know, yeah, everything gets to be holy now, which means that nothing really feels holy anymore. So in conclusion, I want to ask you guys a question. I haven't prepped you for this, but, I, and I imagine you're going to give me very different answers. If some, if somebody, let's say one of your students or a young adult came to you and they had just read Gilead, or some other novel from Robinson, they said, I've just read this. What should I read next that isn't Robinson? Uh, what, what book would you send them to? So for me, I, would, I usually send students either to Wendell Berry or Leif Anger. Leif Anger's Peace Like a River, though, is very different from his Virgil Wander. And Peace Like a River feels more like Robinson, whereas Virgil Wander feels more like Walker Percy me but that's who I would send them to is Leif Anger. So did they like Robinson or they want more like Robinson or they want something different? How about they like it? For you they liked it. Well that's what I was doing too. He liked they like it. Yeah. I can't say just read it the next book in Robinson. Um no <laughs> it's not the rule. It's an arbitrary rule I gave you. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, just because it's on my mind, I'd, I'd, I'd want them to read George MacDonald. Um, maybe start with the princess books, Princess and the Goblin, Princess and Curdie. Um, because I think that MacDonald is also working with this sort of glory in the everyday. And so I'd want, I'd want them to, to be alert to that sort of everyday imagination. See, this would be another disagreement with us because I teach Lilith and Fantasties and they drive me crazy. <laughs> So we need to have a sequel to so have it out a second time. <laughs> Justin's dying inside. I can tell. No, I, I totally get it. Hey, I get it more on, I'm more on McDonald than Robinson. Whenever people ask me about 
recommendations for McDonald. I always have a long disclaimer, <laughs> um, which is why I always start them with the kids kids book, the fairy right. tales. And you shouldn't read Lilith, especially until you've read, you know, 15 of his other books and, mm -hmm. and the divine comedy and, you know, you like understand like what he's trying to do. But uh, I love both of those books though. All right. Well, thanks guys, uh, Justin and Jessica. It's been a real pleasure to have you on again as re my first returning guests. And uh, thanks for the conversation. And we'll look forward to round two, George MacDonald, heretic <laughs> or literary hero. Thanks, Davey. Yeah, thanks, Davey.